I am here with two of the greatest researchers minds in the history of artificial intelligence and computing. Jan LeCun, professor at NYU, chief AI scientist at Meta and Turing Award winner. Also, Joshua Bengio, who's a professor at, I'm not going to say this with a French accent, University of Montreal, founder and scientific director of Mila, Quebec AI Institute, and also Turing Award winner. I thought it would be good to start by asking, what is your broad vision for our path, our journey towards human level intelligence? Maybe, Yosha, you go first. Sure, thanks, uh, Lex. So I believe that we are still far from human level AI. And one of the ways to think about this gap is to look at um, problems that humans are really good at and that machines are not. And, and, and uh, one important such problem is the ability to generalize well on, on new tasks out of distribution or new settings. And if you look at how humans do it, they think they attend uh, uh, to the new situation, they reason around it, they take the time to think about the problem. And that's something that uh, we need to integrate into our AI systems. Um, and we can take inspiration from how brains do it. Um, there are uh, lots that we know about conscious processing that we can actually integrate into machine learning. We can think of this, the way I think about this is, there are preferences or inductive biases or architectural um, uh, preferences that we find in the way the brain works that we can put in, for example, how knowledge is represented in a modular way um, with pieces of knowledge that are reusable, that can be composed on the fly to solve new tasks, how these pieces communicate with each other through a communication bottleneck, um, how the information uh, that's communicated is uh, going through uh, a uh, stochastic hard attention, and uh, how what is selected looks like our thoughts. Uh, and, and that the things that we think about uh, often have a causal interpretation that uh, is related to how we can act in the world, uh, how interventions in the environment are uh, explaining what we're seeing. Um, and, and all that can be done, I think, uh, with neural nets with uh, uh, maybe a somewhat different way of thinking about it. Uh, that's the kind of thing I'm working on. And I, you know, I would love to tell you more about Okay, you said a lot of interesting words there, uh, out of distribution, modular, uh, composing the knowledge pieces together, the stochastic hard attention. So there's causality also in that picture. We'd love to talk to you about all of these, but can you also just elaborate on what is out of distribution? Why is that a fundamental concept? So, so first of all, it's a, it's a practical problem in, in industry. You, you train a system with a data set uh, the data is being collected in a particular way, maybe in some country, and then you deploy the system in a different place, different time, and it, it kind of breaks down. So that's that's a symptom. And um, as an example, humans um, are actually pretty good at uh, a new setting. Like if you if you learned to drive in uh, North America and then you rent a car in London, it's the first time you drive on the left side of the road. It's a challenge, but you can survive it and you pay attention to what is going on. You're generalizing out of distribution and you're adapting also out of distribution. So out of distribution is you learn uh, in, in one city and you have to be able to transfer that and operate successfully in another city. And that is a fundamental aspect of human level intelligence. Humans are able to somehow do this kind of thing, take a leap into the unknown and well, it's not completely unknown. So the reason we are able to drive on the left side in London, if you you know drove all your life in, in North America, is because there are lots of things in common. Like the laws of physics are the same, people are the same. It's just like this one little thing that changed, which is a you know one traffic rule, and our brain somehow has structured information so as to separate these pieces of knowledge, so that we can now just change one thing, which is this rule, and and somehow. Uh, infer our way around it, uh, and then uh, gradually uh, retrain our habits so that we can do well in London as well. 
So Jan, uh, Yosha laid uh, some cool ideas out on the table, inductive biases, uh, generalizing out of distribution. What are your thoughts? What's your vision for human level, uh, for our journey towards human level intelligence? Okay, so Joshua uh, focused on a list of uh, problems that we need to solve. And uh, I agree with the list that, that, that he mentions, but I'm, not fo I'm more focused on, on solutions, actually. Um, <laughs> but, 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 but first of all, uh, uh, you know, we, we, we can clearly see that uh, humans and animals can learn new skills or acquire new, new, new knowledge much, much faster than any of the uh, artificial systems that, um, that, that we've built so far, that we have conceived. Um, they can learn with fewer trials if it's a kind of a new skill. They can, you know, they can learn with uh, fewer examples if it if it you know consists in learning new concepts. So, um, what kind of learning do humans and animals use that we are not currently be being able to reproduce in machines? That's the big question I'm asking myself. Um, what is it that uh, allows a you know a teenager to learn to drive a car in about 15 or 20 hours of uh, practice, whereas you know, even with sort of million of hours of training of uh, in virtual environments, we can get uh, cars to learn to drive themselves to the same degree of reliability. So, um, so there is something that we're missing in uh, sort of current um, uh, approaches to AI. Um, and I think what's missing is the ability of humans and animals to learn um, how the world works, to learn uh, what I call world models. I mean, a lot of people are calling the, uh, are calling it this way. So the, 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 the fact that, um, as Joshua mentioned, you know, the laws of physics don't change if you move from North America to, uh, to Britain. Uh, and so, you know, when you turn the wheel to, to, the, to the right, the car is still going to veer to the right, and, and the basic physics of momentum and everything is, is still going to be the same. This is what allows the, the teenager learning to drive to not have to try to run off a cliff to see what happens. Uh, whereas uh, a sort of naive tabula rasa uh, AI system will have to actually run off the cliff to figure out that it's a bad idea and probably do it a few thousand times before it uh, realizes how not to do it. So, um, so that's, that's, that's what we're missing. How, how do we get um, machines to learn world models, to learn uh, how the world works, mostly by observation, to accumulate the enormous amounts of background knowledge that uh, humans, you know, baby humans uh, accumulate in the first few weeks and months of life, uh, where they figured out like very basic things about the world. The world is three-dimensional. There are objects that are different from things in the background and there are objects that are static, you know, inanimate, um, objects that seem to move, uh, objects whose trajectory is predictable. Um, you know, they fall when they're uh, not supported, things like that. So, you know, we learn all those things in the first few months of life. That, in my opinion, is, is what constitutes the basis for what we call common sense, perhaps. Um, and uh, we don't know yet how to do this with machine, but we have a few ideas like self-supervised learning and, and things of that type. Actually, Jan, I'm very focused on solutions too. I'm sure um, you are. I know you are. And, and some of the things I talked about were sort of the... Uh, early steps in thinking about the world model you were talking about, because I agree it's, it's very, very central. But one of the things I believe is that this world model needs to be structured. So what does it mean structured? It means uh, just like in the brain that the knowledge is uh, somehow decomposed into pieces that are as independent uh, from each other as possible. And there are good reasons why you wanna do that from a theoretical perspective that would help out of distribution. And I'm currently thinking of new algorithms that are precisely allowed to do these kind of things. So, so for you, Yosha, modularity is fundamental. Let me ask, let me zoom out a little bit. So for constructing these kinds of world models for uh, reasoning out of distribution, can you do that with one, one very big differentiable neural network? And if so, what properties does this neural network uh, have? Maybe uh, Jan, take that one. Well, uh, the I guess the two big questions: what is the paradigm of learning that you have to use? The second one is what, what's the architecture of the system that that will will learn this? Uh, there's no question in my mind that that system will have uh, very much in common with what we currently call deep learning. So it might be some giant big neural net that we train with gradient-based 
type uh, algorithm because that's pretty much the only weapon we have at the moment for this kind of problem, that at least the only one that is efficient enough. Um, so, so deep learning is part of the solution, there's no question. Now, in terms of concept for sort of learning paradigms, uh, I've been sort of a big advocate of self-supervised learning. And self-supervised learning is nothing more than this idea that um, uh, you, know, you, you have a piece of the input, some of which is currently observable, and then there is another piece that is not currently observable, maybe because it's covered by uh, you know, uh, an object or something, if it's, if it's vision, or perhaps because uh, it's the future and you have to wait until, uh, for a bit in, you know, until you can see the future. So training a water model consists in looking at the past and the present and maybe remembering what the condition in the world uh, is and then waiting for things to happen and then training your water model to predict what, what just happened. If you just took an action, of course, now your water model knows how to predict the next state of the world from the previous state of the world and the action you took. So you have one of those causal models that uh, Yoshua was, uh, was, was referring to. Um, and and the, the big question is, is, uh, is how you do that. And, and the, the, the technical question under this is how you deal with the uncertainty in the prediction uh, and how you deal with the fact that the, the, the level of abstraction of the representation of the world that you need to construct while doing so uh, needs to be you know, high. It need to be a, needs to be kind of a high level of abstraction. See, so if, um, you know, if I want to predict what's going to happen next, uh, uh, you know, what you are going to do next. Um, I, I know maybe you might, you know, say a word or move your mouth in a particular way, move your head in a particular way, but you're not going to suddenly disappear. Uh, you're not going to kind of, you know, teleport uh, from one, one place of the, the video to another, just, just, just like that. And your, your face is not going to morph into something else, right? So there are like constraints in the physical world that, you know, I, I know uh, prevent those things from happening. And that's basically the, that's the basis of, uh, of common sense and uh, which, you know, common sense is a collection of models, of world models. Um, so so that, what kind of self-supervised learning might allow us to do this? Um, there's a few ideas about this. It's probably not the kind of uh, self-supervised learning that has been very popular uh, until now, where you you directly trying to predict what's going to happen next in the the in the space of uh, observations. So you want to do video prediction, for example. Uh, you see a, a piece of a video, and you train a system to predict the next uh, frames in the video. It's a very very hard problem because you have to, you know, reconstruct all the details of the pixels and everything. And uh, it's very likely to me that, uh, in my opinion, that the type of architecture we need to build are things where the prediction doesn't take place. Uh, necessarily at that level, but takes place in sort of a high level of, of abstraction where the useful information is present and the ir irrelevant stuff uh, isn't. But the abstraction is stored within the same system. It's not like somehow separate. This idea of modularity that Yosha is talking about is really interesting. So maybe Yosha, you could, you could talk about what is this big giant thing that achieves human level intelligence look like? Is it differentiable? Is there, is there some discrete components? What are these different? Uh, is there a fundamental modularity or hierarchy that forms these uh, high level abstractions? What do you think? So if we again look at uh, human uh, condition, um, the thoughts that we have involve a discrete choice among different alternatives. So if you see the NECA cube one way, you don't see it the other way. It's not a mush of different options. And so there, there is, you know, that probably corresponds to a discrete uh, attention. Now, uh, that makes it a little, a little bit more difficult to do end-to-end -end learning. I think we can get around that and, and I have many uh, uh, solutions in my pocket for this, uh, but then locally in each module, so that's the communication between modules. It, it involves discrete decisions, but the um, internal to each module could, you know, could be done fully end to end, I think. Um, so it could be a mix of both. Um, yeah. I mean, What's I missing the, in the, oh. the... The modularity question is an interesting one. So, I, you know, certainly the world model uh, may have multiple modules, but, uh, you know, uh, you don't need multiple modules really for the hierarchy, not any more than you have in a multilayer neural net where there is a hierarchy already of uh, uh, abstract concepts. Um, but, you, but you need other modules than just a world model, right? You need uh, 
first you need a, a module that configures the world model for the situation at hand. Uh, if you have only one world model engine, it needs to be configured for whatever task you are accomplishing. Uh, you need some sort of uh, cost module that um, the system basically, you know, the behavior of the system basically is all directed towards optimizing that cost. Uh, and part of that cost can be sort of hardwired cost, things that, you know, compute pain and pleasure and things like this. And then uh, uh, cost uh, modules that are learned, basically that define sub goals. Uh, perhaps, and then you you know you need to have short-term memory to kind of maintain an estimate of the state of the world in the in the brain of uh, mammals is, is the hippocampus, the vertebrate even, um, and then you need some other module that figures out like what sequence of actions should I do to optimize my cost given my word model. Uh, you, need, you also need perception, so all of those are modules. Uh, I don't think the structure is uh, you know are very necessarily very different from each other, but but there is some sort of macro architecture of an autonomous intelligence system that. You need to devise. So, so I, I, I disagree on one point here. Um, I, I think there may be a good reason why this uh, modularity, which is really the story behind the global workspace theory uh, from Bars, uh, can help to make the right abstractions emerge. And one way to think about it is uh, like the way we program, uh, we, where we use encapsulation. So we try to divide code into little independent pieces, as independent as possible. Of course, it's not completely independent because you, these pieces need to communicate through the arguments and, and return values. But what information do you want to put in the, if you constrain the bottleneck of the communication, is going to be the most abstract aspects that have to do with, uh, you know, what the minimal information that's needed for these experts to collaborate together. Yes. And so, um, I, I think the details of, for example, how a particular function is computed is it can be hidden in, inside each module, but uh, the uh, uh, communication bottleneck helps to force the emergence of these uh, abstract concepts, which is what they exchange with each other. So oh, the yeah, constraints totally are totally agree so with they, that. The constraints are a feature, not a bug. So they force the abstraction. Yes. In yes. Communication. Yeah, and, and, and it's interesting because to, to consider like why would evolution put such a bottleneck in our brains and in probably many other animals? Because like working memory of uh, seven, five or seven items, it seems so small. In fact, other animals have a larger one. Uh, and the brain is huge. So it, it, you know, there must be evolutionary pressure that has verged to this constraint. Uh, Yosha and Jan, you also talk about the source of consciousness in uh, in the human mind and how it might be useful for human level intelligence in the machine. And you talk about the constraints there, that it somehow might emerge from the constraints um, of the, the architecture. Can you maybe talk about why this is something you think about and what is the source of consciousness? Easy questions today. What is the source of consciousness in the human mind and how that might be useful for our AI systems? Yosha? Sure. Uh, well, it's, yeah, it's, <laughs> it's hard. It's a, okay. So first of all, it's a very much open question. Uh, and lots of people would like to understand consciousness and there are a number of competing theories about it. Now, if I, I have to make a, a bet about, you know, something that, uh, fits my understanding and the data I know about from, from the brain and from machine learning, um, I, I would say that the, this, the, the global workspace theory, which is, is the one that proposed this uh, bottleneck idea, is one important element. But there's probably something missing from there. And, and again, looking at the neuroscience theories, um, there is another um, a theory that's uh, a bit more recent that I think could help with uh, the um, illusion of consciousness. So the impression that there is uh, a, 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 a something different in the, the fact that we're experiencing consciously something and it's not just uh, computation. It is all computation. So it clearly is a, an illusion. So the uh, Grajano's theory of um, attention schema theory, is this what it's called, is, is saying there's a, 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 another module besides the, the modules we'll be talking about um, that is a, a, a little model of uh, attention of where are we going to put our attention next. And it's able to plan that. And, and it's like a mini model of the rest of cortex, right? 
And so because it has this, so it's a little bit like an, uh, you know, a uh, homunculus, right? It, it, it's not a very good model of what we actually do, but it, it's good enough to help plan the proper sequence of attention uh, choices. And so that might give rise to that uh, a Cartesian duality, which uh, we seem to feel, but, but is, is probably just a, a, a side effect of this architecture. Yeah, and do you have thoughts on uh, on the consciousness or maybe attention and its that this kind of its role in this kind of uh, system? I think it goes way beyond attention, but you know I have a bit of a kind of a strange opinion about about consciousness, which is actually not disconnected from what what Yashra just said. Um, so I think you know I I, I mentioned earlier that um, you know most of our intelligence uh, comes from our ability to predict, and that comes from our world model. But of course, when we attend to a task the world model that we're using is the world model that is specific to the task at hand. And that has to be, uh, because the world model is a really complex thing, we only have one in our head. We, can, we have one engine that allows us to you know, predict what's gonna happen in a situation, which is why we can only attend to one task at any one time, uh, at least consciously. And so that suggests that we only have one world model and it's being configured by something, okay, that does executive decision, uh, this little um, uh, homunculus-like a system that Yoshua was mentioning that essentially um, is above that and configures all the other modules for the, the task at hand. And that gives us the illusion of, uh, of consciousness, right? Because there is this sort of, you know, meta observer that, that configures the rest of the brain for, for, to attend to a particular task. And it doesn't uh, just configure our world model, it configures our perception system too, right? Uh, you ask people to, uh, uh, attend to uh, you know particular things going on in the scene, and they they become blind to everything else that happens. So, um, uh, so so I think uh, that configurator module, I think that sort of configures the other ones to do a particular thing. Maybe it's the thing that gives us the illusion of uh, consciousness. And so the interesting uh, aspect of this is that consciousness would not be then a consequence of the fact that we are smart, but a consequence of the fact that our brain size is limited. If we had an infinite sized brain, then we could have dedicated world model for all the situation we can encounter. And we wouldn't need a configurator to um, you know, configure our model to the task at hand. So, you know, it's- Consciousness. Yep. So they, they just want to comment on the uh, uh, attention blindness experiments that, that Jan talked about. There's also a related kind of experiment that helps to understand uh, that's the um, uh, blind side. So in, in the kind of experiment that Jan talked about where you, you focus on something and you don't see things that are actually here, uh, actually part of your brain does see them the, at, at the unconscious level and you can actually act uh, accordingly. So um, th that's, that's something weird. Like uh, uh, some people have that because of neurological problems that they, they, they say they don't see anything but they actually will do the right thing to pick up the glass and so on. Okay, let me ask a big uh, question for you. You know, looking back, you're one of the most important, one of the seminal researchers in the field of artificial intelligence. So you can look at the big scope. Uh, think back to the 1990s. Uh, how have you changed uh, in terms of your view of what's required to achieve intelligence? Maybe your fashion choices and so on too, uh, music choices. Uh, but just as an AI uh, visionary, how has your view of, of what's required to achieve human level intelligence changed? And how does that inform you about the coming decades of the evolution of the field of AI? Maybe, Jan, can, can you go first? So the way I tend to operate is that, uh, you know, I, I may have in the back of my mind a very long-term goal, you know, making machines more intelligent, understanding human intelligence and uh, animal intelligence. And then I try to work my way back. Um, so, you know, we don't know any intelligent entity that doesn't, that doesn't learn. So learning must be a very important part of intelligence, right? So how do we do learning? Um, now learning, you know, involves learning to represent things. So it has to be hierarchical, abstract. Um, how can we do this, you know? Learning is always formulated in terms of optimization. So we need some way uh, of, uh, you know, uh, optimizing through gradient descent because that's the most efficient thing we, we know how to do. 
uh, hierarchical architectures. And that's what led to multilayer neural nets and deep learning and backpropagation. Now working our way back. Now, now we need to do to be able to do perception because an intelligent system needs to be able to estimate the state of the world, and that's what perception is about. So let's build a perception system to see if that idea of hierarchy works, right? And that's convolutional nets. Okay, so now we are in the 80s and 90s. Okay, um, and now working our way back. So now we know how to do perception, admittedly in a supervised manner, um, and you know we can we can see that. Uh, 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 humans and animals do not learn in a supervised manner. They learn to represent the world by observation, as I was mentioning earlier. So a bunch of us, um, after having kind of not solved, but you know, sort of passed the stage of supervised learning, got interested into unsupervised learning, or now something I call self-supervised learning. Uh, and Yoshua and I, and you know, Jeff Hinton, basically got together and and sort of discussed this um, uh, in the early 2000s. So you know, that's 20 years ago. Um, where we, you know, formed a little group where people were sort of interesting in, in uh, uh, similar problems. On the way to trying to figure out how to train large neural nets in an unsupervised manner, we figured out how to train large neural nets in a supervised manner using GPUs, and that's what took off. But really, that's not what we were after. We were after unsupervised learning. And so after the first few years of you know, exploiting the fact that we can use supervised learning with very large neural nets and GPU, now we are back to the original problem you know, how do humans and animals uh, uh, learn in a self-supervised, unsupervised manner? Um, and, 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 you know, the reason we need this is not just to learn representations of the world for perception, but also to learn predictive world model for planning, uh, reasoning, uh, et cetera, right? And so that's, that's the progression, right? So you have a long-term goal, and then you kind of figure out, like, what is the first problem I need to solve if I want to move forward towards that goal? And the last, uh, at least my last 35 years, basically have been sort of uh, uh, along, along those lines, um, if not more than 35, actually. <laughs> Time flies when you're having fun. Uh, Yosha, how have your uh, view of AI changed? Um, what's required to achieve human level intelligence? And maybe also, what do you think the next few years and decades look like in terms of the growth and development of the field? Um, I mean, what has changed mostly is have matured, and, and I know a lot more stuff, uh, which helps me supervise <laughs> students better. Uh, I think if I remember the way I was thinking in the, in the 90s, say, uh, which is actually when Jan and I started to collaborate, um, I was very focused on a very small part of the field. And, um, and now it's like, Lots of different aspects of research in AI and machine learning, and, then, and not just machine learning, but you know, even like classical AI, suddenly seem to fit better in a bigger picture, including you know, and also knowledge about neuroscience, coxi, and, and other things. So uh, I, I feel much better equipped to do what Jan was also talking about, and that is, well, reason uh, my way into where we need to go next in order to capture all of these constraints coming from what we know about the brains and what we know from our experience in machine learning and AI broadly. Is, is there, just sorry to interrupt, is there advice, because you mentioned grad students, is there advice you can give to said grad students if they dream about pushing the field forward, about what they should work on? What are the exciting, difficult, um, problems that might crack open this, uh, this problem of human level intelligence? Well, that's what I'm working on. Uh, what would you tell I mean, to, yes, I mean, so what, read my what, latest what advice paper would on you give? That's what I would tell <laughs> advice them. one is read the paper. Yes, yes. But, uh, um, but, yeah. but, but, but in general, I would say more on the methodological side, try to understand what you're doing. So I think, unfortunately, uh, a lot of students uh, because it's easier, we'll just use the concepts that are around in our community and do plug and play and uh, do engineering with that, which can be very useful. But I think if you want to push the, the, the frontier here, you really need to ask the why questions all the time and, and keep asking uh, rather than try to beat the benchmarks. I mean, of course, but that's going to come as a side effect, right? So focus on understanding and the science and the why questions. And that's like the key to science in general. 
Yeah, and do you have, do you have advice for grad students what, uh, and how to the, take the, on this problem? These are two things that have changed in the last 90, you know, the last uh, 30 years or so or, or more. Um, it used to be, you know, in the early 90s, late 80s, when, you, you know, you, you're sure were working on neural nets already, there was a community, you know, that was sort of interested in kind of similar problems that, that we could talk to. And then that community disappeared in the mid 90s. And we were in a combination of fortunate and unfortunate situation. Unfortunate because few people were interested in what we were interested in, but, but fortunate because we could do things that nobody else could do. And we were the only people in the world who to do it. Um, whereas now, um, uh, which is a very good thing, is an enormous amount of people interested in the same stuff that we are interested in, and they know more about our own stuff than we do. Okay, so um, there's a lot of collectively at least. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's there's like you know uh, thousands of uh, you know students and researchers who know more about the latest greatest details of convolutional nets than I do, uh, and it's fantastic. Like you know, I, I really love that. So uh, that means. Uh, if I want to contribute, I need to move on, right? To kind of the, the, the next step. Um, and so what for, for students, like there are many different ways uh, a researcher, a young researcher, particularly uh, in AI can contribute. And, and some of them are, uh, you know, applications of existing methods to new problems. And, the, and you know, the current today's world doesn't lack uh, any supply of problems. Um, so, so that that's an interesting thing. Uh, the second thing is uh, devising new methods that you know improve benchmarks or or sort of known uh, applications like, like you know, computer vision, translation, natural language understanding, this kind of stuff. Um, then there is sort of devising new uh, uh, principles or or algorithms or things like this. And then there is you know, framing a problem in a, in a new way. And the, the, the problem is if you are a young, uh, young, young researcher doing a PhD is that if you want a job at the end of your PhD, you have to do things that may have an impact in a relatively short term, an intellectual impact, not necessarily a practical impact, but at least an intellectual impact. And doing the stuff that is like very ambitious, you cannot afford to do this because you have to finish your PhD in you know, five years if you're in North America, three years if you're in Europe. So, um, uh, so it's a... It's a trade-off, right? So you go for things that might be a little easier and short-term because you know you need a job at the end, uh, you need publications in your in your resume, instead of the super ambitious stuff, which you know only people like us who have tenure and you know have won prizes can uh, can spend our time <laughs> can spend our time doing and try to convince others to work on it as well. Uh, so find a balance because a little bit of the ambitious makes life exciting. So let me, um, it's very possible that since we're talking remotely that I'm just a human-like avatar and there's an AI chatbot behind uh, that's generating the words I'm saying. Uh, that's an interesting Turing test question that we could talk about uh, later. But if you look at the um, future of a world where there's AI systems that achieve human level intelligence, what excites you about that world? What are the, is it the human a connection with chatbots and things like that, or is it very specific applications? What What is cool to you about this world? Uh, maybe Jan, you go first. I think it's the amplification of human intelligence. So the the um, the fact that you know every human could do more stuff, essentially, be more productive, more creative, um, uh, perhaps uh, f spend their time on more fulfilling activities. Uh, things like that, which is really the history of uh, technological evolution, right? So I think uh, that's that's the exciting uh, uh, part, in my opinion. And then, you know, of course, uh, th there's going to be kind of, you know, specific things that people will get interested in, like, you know, uh, virtual assistants, and they, they can talk to, they can answer any question and, and things like that. And, um, uh, and when you have, you know, when you have a, a difficult... Uh, uh, intellectual challenge and problem, you won't be alone to solve it. You'll have, you know, AI systems to uh, help you with the, with that. So there's always the the fear, you know, that technology is going to make us stupid or or weak. But I don't believe in this at all. Like it's not like, you know, pocket calculators has made us bad at mathematics. On the contrary. Yeah, they made us better. Uh, Yosho, aside from making video games uh, better, uh, what do you think will be exciting about? Um, 
a world where we solve or begin to solve human level intelligence? Well, I agree very much with the picture Jan has drawn, but I will add some, some things. Um, that augmentation is going to help us become better at scientific discovery. So that's, there, that's where there's a positive feedback loop here, right? Um, we used to rely completely on human minds to understand, say, the outcome of experiments and then propose new experiments, make sense of the world. And now we're building those machine learning tools that essentially are uh, you know, growing towards that, that capability. Um, and that's going to accelerate the progress of science. Uh, and, and that can have profound positive impacts on, 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 on everyone. So for example, in healthcare, like understanding better how cells work, uh, how cancer works, right? Uh, how uh, viruses are able to get around our defenses. So this is very complex and it, 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 up to now, it's been very slow in some sense to make sense of, of these hard questions, whether it's in biology or astrophysics or whatever. But we 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 are building up tools that I think will uh, change radically how we do science and how we discover treatments and and, and everything like this. Yeah, and of course, the, you know, m m modeling uh, uh, complex. Uh, complex behavior of complex systems, um, things like, you know, materials, um, you know, climate, climate, uh, uh, you know, energy storage and batteries and, uh, you know, production of uh, hydrogen to store energy, which would be a big, a big step towards uh, solving climate change issues, uh, controlling plasma infusion reactors, you know, I mean, so there's all kinds of, of things like this that I have the potential to, you know, solve, uh, you know, big problems in the world. Uh, and they're all kind of collective phenomena that uh, sort of the, the classical reductionist uh, way of uh, analyzing uh, uh, or modeling things doesn't quite work because they are complex collective phenomena. Um, so now we need, what we need are kind of phenomenological models that, we can, that cannot be contained uh, in our head, cannot be contained in a few formula on the paper, uh, and, and have to be sort of basically uh, implemented by machines, which you know, will allow us to make predictions, perhaps not understand to the same extent that we, you know, we can understand uh, simple physical phenomena, but, um, but that, that will help us a lot for, uh, indeed, for progress of science. I mean, this is, an, this is another idea, the idea that uh, you know, analyzing data using machine learning and sort of what we now call AI, uh, well help with science, uh, you know, started emerging, you know, something like 15 years ago, certainly in, in, in uh, uh, genomics and things like this. And uh, I created a, a center for data science at NYU about, about 10 years ago for that, per for that reason, for that purpose. And of course, let me, let me, let me just uh, sure. like give an example to sure. uh, maybe make a bit more concrete what, what Jana is, is uh, talking about and also connect it with the earlier discussion about representation learning and self-supervised learning. So think about what uh, physicists and chemists have done when they have invented abstractions like pressure and temperature. These are not things that exist at the low level, you know, of the physics. Um, they are complete like you know inventions of our minds that happen to have really nice um, abstraction properties that you can describe phenomena at an abstract level using very few variables and 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 predict things very reliably at least at the aggregate level so this is the sort of thing that up to now only human minds could do but but i see that as learning the right abstractions uh, such that at that level of representation things become easier uh, to uh, model. So the kinds of world models that Jan were talking about, was talking about, they need that kind of abstraction, that kind of structure that's going to be discovered by, by the learner so that suddenly things make sense. And it becomes much easier to explain lots of things when you introduce these high level abstractions. Absolutely. That's the, yeah. you know, the underlying, uh engine of, of, of intelligence is the construction of abstraction that allows you to make predictions, essentially. And perhaps engineering such artificial intelligence systems will help us understand our own uh, human mind uh, further, which has yes. been something that humans have dreamed and drove towards for, 
for um, millennia. So uh, it is truly an honor, Jan and Yosha, to talk with you today. This is uh, something that AI systems of the future will look back at uh, with admiration. So thank you for your time today. This is awesome. Thanks to you. Thanks, Rex. Always a pleasure. Thank you.